Hello and welcome back to another episode of Marriage on a Tightrope. I'm Alan. And I'm Katie. And we're still married. Today, today, today. I was going to say sabado, 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 but it's it's not sabado. It's not sabado. It's lunes. Lunes, lunes, lunes. So we are, in fact, this entire episode is Katie's doing. You kind of led the last one too. Well, I wouldn't say it's my doing, but I... Maybe. Maybe. You prompted the content for this episode. I guess I did. (laughs) So what we did, Katie posted on Instagram and on Facebook the following question. And the question was, what is the most pressing issue of your mixed faith marriage today? So Katie and I have gone through all of the comments and we've put them into a fancy Microsoft Word. We are word proficient. (laughs) We put them into a, a Word document and just categorize them and kind of group them together. They came out to most of them fit into three buckets. And here are the three buckets. We'll just tell you what those are. The first one we'll talk about is communication and intimacy. Next is kids. That was the, I mean, if you could imagine a huge bucket that you're holding from costs from Lowe's or Home Depot and big orange bucket and it's overflowing with water or mud, whatever you want to call it, that would be our child bucket. If you bought a gallon of K Bueno nacho cheese from Costco, <laughs> over half of that nacho cheese would be about the kids. <laughs> Is Man, there another weird analogy I'd, we can I make? I mean, it, well, I mean, I think that the the mud or the nacho cheese example is it just tells you how messy. And literally how complicated. And fattening. And fattening and exhausting. And I mean, you can't hold that bucket forever. Okay, we will stop with that. So communication and intimacy. Communication, kids. Kids. And lastly is negotiating the tenders. What does that mean real briefly, Katie? I when I think of the tenders, I think of chicken tenders. But I also think of <laughs> oh, delicious. I am. Um, uh, I also think of things that are hard to discuss. So, for example, Alan, are you going to go back to church with me? Are you going to baptize my daughter? Are you going right. to X, Y, and Z? It's it's, it's like behavioral changes that are going to naturally deviate from the norm now that one person doesn't believe in the church anymore. And those are difficult topics to to discuss. So those are the three buckets. Katie, let's start with communication and intimacy. We don't need to read every single comment, but out of the comments that that were given, why don't you read one of them? We can just discuss a few as we go. Sure. I'll go to Instagram and then you can look at the ones at Facebook. But uh, a super common thing that we hear is that there is just silence. There is no talking about it. You are trying to avoid the topics that you need to discuss. You know, isn't, uh, if you're familiar with John Gottman, isn't one of John Gottman's four horsemen, horsemen. of marriage. So one of, if one of these, even just one of these four, um, ideas is present in the marriage, he can predict with, it's isn't like 85% accuracy it's, it's that, pretty your, high. that your divorce, that your marriage will end in divorce. Right. Stonewalling is one of them. And that's what this is. I I refuse. I will not talk about this. I think it's something that if you really think about the moments in your marriage that that have stood out, when I think about the last few years with you, Katie, the moments where we've had, quote, breakthroughs. I mean, what are you breaking through? You don't break through anything unless it's hard, right? If it's easy, there's nothing to break through. So those difficult moments, those difficult conversations, they're supposed to be uncomfortable, Right? They're, they're supposed to be difficult. Yeah. I think, too, um, in those conversations, something that you can feel in your relationship is that maybe you don't have so much in common anymore, that you've lost unity or you've lost purpose in your marriage, and you don't know what what you can come together on. That's a really hard thing to realize and to feel like. You, you've lost your spouse. Right. It's a different person. Different person. Yeah. Another, another of the comments on Facebook says the same thing. Lack of spiritual connection and shared meaning. I think it, it takes really purposeful sitting down and outlining all the things you do have in common. All the things like, look, I still believe that being honest is really important. And 
just because I don't believe in the concept of sin anymore doesn't mean that I don't think I can act. Doesn't mean I think I can act without consequence. There are still consequences here, and I still believe in in doing good for others and service and charity and all of these things. There's so many things that left unsaid, the the spouse that is still believing may draw some conclusions that aren't totally accurate. They aren't totally true. Right. You know, in, in the course we do with Natasha, one of the things that she does so well is she guides our couples and Alan and I, of course, through this really kind of murky spot where you feel like you don't have anything in common. We talk a lot about it. And then the assignments that we give out are to help couples find common ground with each other. And it's meant to enhance the relationship and to help you both realize, no, we still want some of the same things and it may look different and we may have different language about it or different ideas about it, but there's so much that we can come together on. And, and I think that that's such a positive move and thing you need in your marriage. Yeah. One of the, one of the exercises is a core values exercise to find things in common. And the output is something you can literally put on your wall, which is really, really cool. It's really fun right now. The wall behind Katie is just baseball. Um, that is all of our common values at this point is just <laughs> baseball. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're in my office. Hashtag so. COVID. Okay. Hashtag, hashtag Dodgers won the world series. That's a long <laughs> hashtag. So yeah, I mean, here's another one that's very similar. Um, on Facebook says, I guess the divide, I feel like there is a big problem with intimacy, not the sex kind, the different level connection. We are light years apart now in how we see the world. We used to be more unified. Now it seems like every issue causes a bigger rift. Sometimes we come back together, but the election caused major fights between us. Not going to lie. It's been a hard year. It has been a hard year. You know, we are mixed politics marriage. Katie voted for Trump and I voted for Kanye. So... No, we didn't. No, we didn't. No, no. You in know fact, what? Maybe we shouldn't. You, clearly, that was a joke. Clearly, that was a joke. Clearly, and that let's was not a joke. clear the air of who we actually voted No, for. let's not. But, you know, <laughs> a friend of mine said, you need to start a political podcast that is called Nation on a Tightrope. Nation on a Tightrope. Which is actually pretty bi- brilliant because, as the election proved, we are a nation on a tightrope. Uh, so, yeah, I love this. I love this comment because it it can just creep into every facet of your new life, what you're thinking, what you're believing, what your political views are. And that has nothing to do with religion, but it is equally as emotionally charged as religion. Right. I like how she says as well, I, she, if I recall correctly, uh, that intimacy isn't always the sex kind. And Natasha talks about that too in the course, week two. <laughs> sure. And we talked about these in our last episode. Oh, you're right. The, you're right. The four intimacies, which is physical, spiritual. Emotional, spiritual. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> and intellectual. That's right. And I, I love the, the thought of, do you find yourself curious about your partner? Is your partner still interesting to you intellectually? And I, I, do, I love trying to learn what drives you i think it's really fun what drives me yeah like i'm curious i want to be curious about who you are and i think that's easier to do when there are changes going on it right can, it can be scary to it's do. very scary for me i i don't want to know your changes <laughs> because <laughs> i mean in the, especially in the beginning when you were changing with the religion and the faith transition i didn't really want to know your newfound or maybe ideas. maybe you were maybe I don't it, know. If it was threatening to me. Sure, it was. yeah, yeah. It was threatening threatening to me in the beginning. That was a hard hard thing to think about. And Alan would say things that I couldn't say back. So, for example, Alan has said to me in the past, and he still does now. But in the past, when he has brought this up, he would say things like, "I've just loved seeing you develop into the person you are today." And I think that that was a little bit charging for me because I thought, oh, no, he is expecting me to say something like that back to him. 
Just so we're clear, I was not saying that so that you would say it back. No, I know. I know that's not what you're saying, but I I just want to make that clear. I know, but (laughs) I'm just saying, though, in those moments where one is expressing that to you, that can be very put up a wall between you and feel like, like, I don't feel the same way I don't feel the same way about you yet. I... Maybe I won't. I don't know. I'm still holding on or right. I'm I'm still feeling very um, sad about our situation. And you have said that to me now that time has passed and that means a whole lot. But I think it takes a lot of trust. Like you have to trust that who I'm going to change into is not some someone that is doing harmful things to you, to the kids, to myself, that I'm I'm going to continue to be a quote, good person. Uh, and in some ways better, hopefully. Right. Um, I think that over time when that trust is there, it's easier for you to kind of put that stamp of, Hey man, I like who you're turning into. You'd never say, Hey man to me, by the way, but Hey babe. Hey babe. Hey babe. <laughs> yeah. So I think that if you are really struggling in the communication, um, intimate intimacy department, uh, Look for ways that you can become more intimate with each other, either by talking through things, by not avoiding things, by learning some new tools. That's yeah. going to be key is is finding someone that will guide you through to learn new tools in order to communicate better. This last comment on communication and intimacy uh, actually drives that point home. So this, this uh, Facebook user mentioned reconnecting and reminding each other of how we view the other. It's easy as time goes by for us to forget how important it is to hear how we support each other on our individual paths. That is one of the greatest gifts that you can give to your spouse, whether regardless of which side of belief you're on is to support them in their individual path. So with Katie, I mean, it's a little easier, I think. Uh, perhaps for the spouse that is transitioning away because you, you've, you, you kind of know what it looks like to support a spouse that is a believing active member of the church because you've been there before. And so the conversation that we had around primary, for example, of like, how can I support you in that? Mm -hmm. And those, those, uh, doing Easter, um, or, uh, for mother's day this year, we did, um, we dressed up in full, it was the first time I've worn a white a button up white shirt in like two and a half years, but we, uh, we dressed all the kids up and we had home church with your family uh, uh, via zoom. Cause it was in the middle of the pandemic and those little things. And you do the same thing for me. Um, you bought me a beer at Fenway when we went to the Boston and Yankees game. Little did I know Alan does not like that. No, I don't. But it was such, I, I absolutely wanted to try because it was, the, it was a summer game at Fenway Park and there, you've got to have it a beer. It was the Yankees and the Red Sox. Yes. And Jeez. so she bought me a beer and that was a, that was a really big sign of like, I'm supporting you. And I'm like, oh, thank you. This is disgusting, but thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, all of those things just fall under that first category that was probably um, the best ones out of all of them that would describe communication problems. The next bucket, which is the biggest bucket of all, is children. Dun, dun, dun. So it is easy to make a decision when it's just you or it's you and your spouse, right? You can have some some autonomy in your relationship and you sometimes you can make some of those decisions on your own when it comes to children when you have two different people weighing in on these children that you've brought to this life and now you're trying to figure out how to work through that that can be so painful yeah. that can be so tricky that can be um just a can of worms in and of itself, and especially depending on the age of your children. So Alan and I, um, especially towards the beginning of recording the podcast, a, a number of people would say to us, I don't know how you're doing this with little kids. And let's see, it was four years ago, so our oldest was nine or ten. Right. And uh, then it went all the way down to like two. But they kept saying, I just can't imagine I can't imagine. And Alan and I really actually didn't look at it that way. And we viewed it as it's actually really lucky that they're growing up knowing that we have differences 
and that they are not going to know any any other any different than that right modeling the we can be different and still have a loving marriage it's a great example to give your kids because what awesome what better way to prepare them for the real world than show you can think and believe and 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 act differently than other people and still be their friend and still be their coworker and still be in their study group and still be their spouse it is not only is it okay it's healthy and that's what we're trying to model for the kids you know we've had some hard conversations with the kids but for the most part like they've shown themselves to be extremely resilient and and Go I'm ahead, not, yeah. and I'm, I'm going to say here, I'm not naive to think that there isn't pain because there is absolutely pain. And we've seen that with the baptism. We've seen that with the ordination. Yeah. We've seen the pain um, happen within the kids and it's sad and it's hard, but our jobs as Natasha would say is to be a mediocre parent, right? <laughs> we are not to give just give them everything they want. We are not to shelter them from any type of pain. We are to, we are, we need to allow ourselves um, and them to learn resiliency and to learn um, just how to deal with other people's differences. And this is one way we try to model that. So let's go through with some of the things that are the most tender <laughs> in raising children. So I have here just on my Instagram feed, uh, the decision whether or not to have kids, some mm -hmm. who are just now getting married and, you know, they're feeling the pinch because they're getting late into their twenties, which is so funny to say, but late into their twenties, maybe early thirties. And they are thinking we've got to have kids, but super afraid to bring kids into the world and not knowing how they're going to do it with them. Uh, you know, those tenders of baptisms, those ordinances, those are really hard. Uh, how, how you're going to be able to communicate your view and your spouse be able to communicate their view in a respectful manner. Right. Do we just throw up everything? Ellen, do you throw up everything you know about church history to our kids? Absolutely not. <laughs> of course there you not. Go. Not. No, I mean, it, it. first of all, you don't want to be that parent that that's whenever you have a moment alone with a kid, that's what you're talking about. Like, this is what I'm always going to be shoving through, down their throat when I have a when I have a moment when I'm driving my son to baseball. That's what I'm going to bring up. Hey, uh, what do you think about church or what do you believe about this? Or did you know this? It's it makes you a boring, predictable parent. So that's just from a being an interesting person to your kids, that's that's not a great, really great tactic to just constantly bring it up and bring it up and bring it up. But it's also, I think you you let the children lead the way. You take their lead. So this is being child-centric. So yeah. if your child has a question about there's something they learned in seminary or something that they learned at church, and there are two different opinions, how do you represent yourself and how do you represent your spouse? Yeah, I mean, it's okay to say, this is what mom feels, this is what dad feels. We feel differently, and you can feel either way or any other way in between. And how you feel about it is just as legitimate as us. You're not going to be choosing your mom or your dad based on what you believe. If, you know, our eight-year-old, it's very clear to her that we both support her regardless of whether she decides to get baptized now or if she waits until post pandemic or when dad can do it, which isn't going to happen. So she knows that her being baptized is not her choosing mom over dad. So, I mean, it's, I think that we have a, I think handled it really well with the kids, but also B we've really lucked out because it hasn't been that difficult with them. Yeah. But I, we've also made really a lot of mistakes, which is why, you know, this works so well for all of you. <laughs> Because you can learn from the really bad mistakes we've made. We've made some major mistakes with the kids. And we have not communicated enough. Just when we think that we are doing a good job, something will happen and it'll remind us that, oh, we aren't 
we are not communicating enough about this topic. Right. So that is something over communication with the children. I want to read this comment here that, um, I like because I just, it hits home to me. It says, I am the active believing, believing Mormon. I think for me, it's accepting and working out for myself that it's going to be okay not raising my kids the way I was raised in a super orthodox way. There's lots of guilt associated with that, but I think I'm okay with it right now. But ask me in 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, so this, I laughed at this because I absolutely go back and forth. Now, I mean, for the most part, Alan, did you have a fairly good upbringing in the church? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Did you? I I did. I had a super positive experience. And this is not for everyone. I know this. But in my home, in with my leaders, I had a very positive experience. And I, I, I have thought about this. What am I... What are my kids missing out on because I'm not shoving them, I'm not pushing them to do seminary. I'm not pushing them to do this or the other. You know, we have one son who does not care, who, who's like, I am i don't have any interest in this, um, who isn't attending seminary, who just doesn't, it's not his thing. And we have another one who told us the other day that he, he wanted to go to seminary that he probably want wanted to try out for the BYU baseball team. Right? And Alan <laughs> Alan quickly said, You know, there's a place called you know, the, the University, University of Utah. Utah has a great baseball team. <laughs> and I said, Yeah, but you know, it BYU is me and dad's alma mater, right? So I I definitely feel this pain of the guilt that we put on ourselves that we're not giving our kids everything that we received. And not every child is alike. Not every child is going to have the same experience. I think that's a little bit of projecting, right? I'm projecting my feelings about how my experience with the church, just thinking and saying it is the best thing for my kids when clearly my oldest is like, mom, that is not the best thing for me. And my my second one's like, oh, yeah, I think I'd be okay doing that. So I think ask yourself, you know, in those moments of guilt, ask yourself, is this because I'm projecting my feelings? Yeah. I think we all, even growing up, you and I, even though we both had good experiences in the church, uh, we both grew up in different types of LDS families. And there is one thing for sure. If you're in a mixed faith marriage, it's going to look different. And that's, that's hard to accept, especially at first, but it's going to look different. The sooner that you can have that conversation with family, ward leaders, other ward members of what our involvement in the church is, is going to look different now because we're managing a mixed faith marriage here. We're manage we're giving our kids a lot more autonomy than, than we used to, or that I had when I grew up and that's going to look different. So, I mean, there's, there's a reason why we spend two weeks on, on raising children in, in our workshop with, with Natasha. In fact, Katie, now might be a good time to make a couple of announcements. Oh, yay. <laughs> you excited? It's been a long time. I am excited. A lot of work coming up to this point. There has been a lot of work put into this. And so super excited about some options that we wanted to give you. Because here is the thing, everybody. One of the concerns that people had that we've received emails about uh, with the course is that sometimes the time doesn't work out for them, that we meet on Tuesday and Sunday, and you know, every single Sunday night we're at my parents' for dinner or whatever it may be. Tuesday nights, my son has basketball, and it's just not good. The time doesn't work. So we, we're kind of cracking our heads together, figuratively, thankfully, uh, to figure out, okay, how can we solve for those people that that the timing itself just doesn't work out. Right. And, and also I feel like there are so many of you out there who want guidance, who are like 
just thirsty for some sort of roadmap, but your spouse is not there. Your spouse is not ready to talk about it. They're not ready to be in a group setting where they are connecting with other couples Mm -hmm. and um, sharing their story because things are on the surface and things are raw and they're tender. And so because of that, we have come up with some options for all of you. So the first announcement we want to make is that we will have the workshop, the the next workshop start on January 19th, and it will go until February 23rd. It is every Tuesday and Sunday. The great thing is, is we have already recorded all of the presentations, so you can watch the presentation. And our Tuesday and Sunday nights are literally for the couples to ask Natasha questions, to go over the curriculum, to talk about what we learned that week, and um, to go over the assignment that we give you, the tightrope in action is what we call it. Super catchy, isn't it? Uh, Oh, yeah. (laughs) And so we do that every Tuesday and Sunday night for six weeks. So that registration for that class is open. And this really is so... I can't even say how much it helps our couples. One, feel like they're not the only ones. Two, gain perspective on where other people are in their own marriage. You know, they ask, people ask a lot of really um, intelligent and helpful questions that maybe you wouldn't have thought of in a group setting. You know, I've, one of the many things I've loved about this group are groups that have come together is the camaraderie, I think, and just the intimate way that they share themselves with each other and that they meet after. Like our yeah. first group we did last in last in, um, April, was that March or yeah, April? April, yeah. Uh, they continue to meet every month to discuss how they're doing, help each other out, give each other ideas. Our other two groups have created Marco Polo groups to talk to one another. And, you know... I think that it's like one of the key things is connecting with others. You know, it's very lonely in this space. So when you can connect to another couple and they're in the same boat as you, or you just really are on the same playing level as them, um, those friendships are just so key for people. So you can go to marriageonatightrope.thinkific.com. Wait, how do you spell thinkific? Thinkific is think. T-H-I-N-K, and then IFIC, I-F-I-C. So T-H-I-N-K, I-F-I-C. Marriage in a Tightrope, all one word, no spaces, dot thinkific.com. That option is there. But you're going to see a few other options, which we're going to explain here in a second. But I think it's important to note that in this course, you're getting six weeks, three hours a week with Natasha Helfer, who is a 20-plus year veteran in Mormon mixed faith marriages and a certified sex therapist. She has a lot of cred and getting 18 hours with her over the course of a month and a half is a huge value. And we are so, so lucky that she still wants to partner with us. I don't know if we're worth the hassle. (laughs) No, I mean, it is, it is so lucky. I don't, I mean, I'm sure many of you have looked for therapists, have tried different hats on to see which therapist might work for you and your spouse. And let me tell you, Natasha is a straight shooter and she does not take sides. And that's one thing I love about her. She is equally as gracious to the believer as she is the non-believer. So she is going to present things with a clinical hat on right? If you ask her a question about her personal um, opinion, then she can take that clinical hat off. But that's how all of the presentations are run, is with a clinical view, which I think helps to be just as as non-biased as possible. And, uh, you know, we are so grateful that she is willing to do this, because if you tried to get a session with her individually, you would pay, I don't, I mean... Two times in two hours what yeah. what you pay for the course. Right. So we're very lucky to have her. So that is the first option. We would love to see all of you in that. Okay, the second option. So This we're goes call- back to those people that can't yes. quite meet the time frame or aren't ready to be in a group setting. Right. So I think that there are some of you out there who are wanting to go at your own pace. 
right? So to speak. So we have an option for you. Uh, we are doing right now, um, if you do a pre register we're doing like a pre-registration. So uh, starting from now until December 1st for the next two weeks, this option will be available where you log in. The presentations are already uploaded. You can go through each presentation by yourself with your spouse, however you would like to do it. You have a homework assignment, a tightrope and action assignment, and you do that together, and then you can move on to the next presentation. There are six in total. There is probably over 15 hours of content right? and really tools to teach you how to navigate this mixed faith marriage. In each of those presentations, you're going to have Natasha teaching the clinical content, and Katie and I are there to share our experience with it. So you still get that mixed faith marriage learning from other couples because Katie and I are there talking about our experience as well. And we have a little video introducing the, um, the tightrope in action, um, exercise for that week. The discussion boards are available and activated within Thinkific. So if you do want to post and have conversations with other couples, um, on each individual topic, you're more than welcome to. And so you can still get that functionality of having other couples that are going through similar content and experiencing similar, uh, sometimes pains and joys in mixed faith marriage. That uh, is certainly a very key part of it. So that's going to, so Katie, that's available until December 1st, as far as pre-registration or? Yes. And after pre-registration, this is again, our black Friday deal, uh, after pre-registration is over after December 1st, it will go up $50. So, so both will the, the January workshop, course, right? the January okay. workshop, as well as the do it your go your own pace, um, workshop. Katie's our finance person. So I have to ask her all those finance questions. I make all the, dis- no, I don't <laughs> anyway. And then the third option, which we're actually also very excited about is Natasha has, has graciously, um, provided a couple of hours of her sex and intimacy master class. So this is included in the pre-registration with the workshop um, for the group setting for January 19th for that group. Uh, you can get that when you purchase that. Um, anyway, but it's a couple hours of sex and intimacy. There's a lot of things she covers. She covers lots of topics uh, that she sees with mixed faith marriages. You know, what if there's a high libido and a low libido partner? Uh, How do I move on from maybe you have some guilt or um, some sadness surrounding your sexuality and lack of what if syndrome, what if syndrome, that's right. Of like, what if I wouldn't have felt this way growing? I would have lived so much differently as a, as a low twenties or I wouldn't have gotten married so young. Like there's a lot of really difficult things and that could cause the other spouse to think, man, you're, you're saying you wish you wouldn't have married me. No, 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 I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. So there it's, that topic is more than just how to have good sex. Um, that is part of it and it's a fun part of it, but there's the six, the six, um, what do they, what does she call it? The six principles of, of a healthy sexuality Mm -hmm. that she goes through. And that's, that's super, super helpful. I've heard, we both heard her sing it at a karaoke night. (laughs) (laughs) I'm pretty sure she doesn't want us to talk about this. (laughs) That's as far as I'll go. That's right. uh, Yeah. We love that one. So that one is available on Thinkific as well. Now, like you mentioned, Katie, if you sign up before December 1st, you get that included, but you can go to that Thinkific site, marriage and a title dot Thinkific dot com and just purchase and enroll into the sex and intimacy course that includes, there's actually four different, um, your tightrope in action five, if you want to get kinky, but four <laughs> at home oh exercises, uh, with the sexuality course. And they're super, super great. Right. They are from a sex therapist, an LDS sex therapist at that. So you're going to get a lot of really good information, a lot of useful things. That price will not go up. It won't change. Right. That will just stay there. That will stay the same. So there is the announcement. Three different (laughs) ways that you can 
give yourself or your partner the gift of therapy. Yeah. Great, and great great Christmas gift. Right, it's a great Christmas gift. Oh, something we did want to mention is if you have HSA money just sitting this is in really important. right, just sitting in your account and you know, it goes away after the new year and you want to spend it on something, we are allowing HSA payments. You just have to contact us. You just have to email us at marriageonatightrope at gmail.com and we will get all of that information from you. You can use your HSA card for any of the three options you would like to. And again, it's a, a great gift for you and your spouse. That's so right. for the January course, we only allow 25 couples. So uh, that usually fills up pretty quick. So sign up now. Okay. We have one last topic of these comments, this last bucket, and it is negotiating the tenders. So these are those things that are a little difficult. Uh, one spouse is changing. It's not always on the spouse that's changing, by the way. Church attendance is one. Uh, the kids going to church. Um, there, there are things, you know, temple attendance is one that is, is, could be difficult uh, that needs to be negotiated. But uh, a few of the comments. Uh, here's one that is a perfect example of what we're talking about. For me, it's that I feel like I have to play by all of the Mormon rules. I have to get permission to teach my kids what I believe, have a cup of coffee in my own home, etc. It's just so much control of who you have to be and that these are the rules even when one spouse doesn't believe. That sums it up pretty well. It does. Doesn't it, Katie? It does. And negotiating the tenders both with children like we talked about and between each other is very difficult and can be very um, charged in a negative way. And so... it's important to learn tools in order to know how to talk about these things. Maybe there are, maybe there are tenders on my list or Alan's list that are not super important to me, but are super important to Alan. Right. I mean, coffee was one of those. Um, Alan wanted it in the home and I did not for a while. And he waited until it was not really a big deal for me. And then he got, uh, French press. <laughs> yeah. And I would, I make probably two cups a week, maybe. Yeah. It's not, it's not very often. I have since stopped gagging at the smell of it. So, you even clean out my French press for me. And yes, that's really nice. Yes. <laughs> so these are all now, listen, guys. I mean, I know that there are other pressing matters that are happening in your before, marriage today. Before we move on. Sorry. Yeah. I've got one negotiating the tender stuff. Oh yeah. I think my favorite tool that has really taken a lot of pressure off is taking it to the lab for me, taking it to the lab. That concept is basically no decision is final, right? You can come back and renegotiate. You can try something and see if it works and it may work for a while. And then when it doesn't work anymore, bring it back to the lab, sit back down with the spouse and talk about it again. Church attendance is the, the example that we've used over and over again. You can go and look at all, all of the different episodes we've had about attending church because we've yeah. tried it all. We've I stopped, tried it all. I, I kept going all three hours and then I went just to sacrament for a while and then I stopped going all together and then I went back and then we decided to do home church the first Sunday of every month and then COVID happened and we didn't have any choice but to do home church every week of the month. <laughs> so this is, you know, when church goes back live again and in person uh, full time I'll be back there and maybe in a year I won't want that anymore and taking it back to the lab is is perfect it doesn't have to be a final decision and I think that it's easier to see things that way it's easier to feel like okay this is working like you don't you're not tied to it I think that that can be a little bit scary on my part if I think like oh my gosh how are how are the kids going to get used to this up and down and changing our mind. Guess what? You are allowed to change your mind. Yep. And we have done so over and over and over again. And it's all about pivoting. Pivot. 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 Name that 90s sitcom. No, oh, friends. I love you. <laughs> uh, you know, I know that we have not touched on everything there is today. I'm sure that there are things that don't fall into this category that you're thinking are so difficult that you are dealing in your mixed faith marriage today. You're not alone. This is happening with ever increasing frequency. 
Our Facebook group is almost to 2,000 users, and not all of them have a spouse in the group. So probably 3,000 couples are represented, and that's just in the Facebook group. There are so many people likely in your ward that you just don't know are in a very similar, if not the same, situation. That's both distressing to hear and very comforting to hear that you are not alone. We are in it ourselves and we are thriving. Aren't we? We are. And you know what? I, I, I don't talk about mixed faith marriage at all on my personal feed. Uh, I think that it makes people feel awkward and I never want that. And I have a space to talk about it. So I don't, I don't, but recently I posted pictures of the girls trip I took and kind of my feelings about connecting with people who understood where I was. And then someone asked to join our group and it was someone I knew and she, I I wanted to get some more information. And so I started messaging back and forth and she has a son that's left. And she said, it has, it almost killed me. It literally almost killed our relationship because I didn't know how to handle it. We didn't know how to talk about it. We didn't know what to do about it. And this, your podcast has been super helpful for me to get just a look into his life or what he's feeling or how I should be talking to him. And kudos to this mom for taking those steps in order to want a deeper intimate relationship with her son. But there are just as many people out there listening who have kids or siblings or friends and they are not in this situation, but they're listening because they want to be someone that you can lean on. And so I think that that is comforting to know that there are people on our team, there are people on our side, even if it doesn't feel like it's right around us. But I think also when you put yourself out there, thank you to the many people who responded to my Facebook post yes. because this has provided such good content for this episode. When you put yourself out there, um, it really helps other people feel connected Go be someone that others can lean on. If you know someone that's in a similar situation, reach out to them. Let them know that that you understand what they're going through, that you can be there just to listen if they need it. Uh, And we hope that you find someone you can lean on as well. If you need to lean on us, lean on us. That can mean a Facebook message, an Instagram message, an email to marriageonatirehope at gmail.com. We try to respond to every single email that we receive. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but... If you need to be heard, we are happy to listen to you. We love you. We truly, truly, truly do. We don't know all of you and we wish we could. We cannot wait for this pandemic to end because we are craving to be in person with y'all. Yeah, I'm thinking like women's retreat, couples retreat, Vegas retreat for the men. (laughs) (laughs) You <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's not the best idea. You name you name the retreat and we will plan it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Marriage on a Tightrope. We will see you very soon within the next seven days. Happy marriage. <laughs>